And my brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. So one day you're in and the next day you are out, right? Isn't that how the, the saying goes? I don't know if you're into March Madness. Some people I know consider this time of year to be like a national holiday and they take off work for it, you know, and they set themselves up with TV screens uh, just to immerse themselves in all of the fun, right? The March Madness. I am not one of those people, just to be clear. I don't even fill out a bracket because who can guess? How can you guess what's going to happen? I mean, all the upsets just in the last few days uh, that have already occurred. One day you're a team with a number three ranking and you have the dreams of the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight and the Final Four in front of you and the next day you pay, play a pesky team ranked 14th, you know, some team named Oakland and you're Kentucky, right? And Oakland shows up and some guy makes all these three-pointers and your toast and all of your dreams are out the door. I think we can tell other stories too, Yale and Auburn. There are probably other upsets that I don't know about. I know too much already for not even following it. How do I know these things? Still, one day you're in and you got the hopes and dreams of glory in front of you and the next day you are out how life goes, isn't it? Which we know about life, right? That just like that in the blink of an eye, what you think one day and what is in front of you one day, we know that all of that can change overnight and in an instant. And yet it's still, when it happens, it's ha it has this way of surprising us. When our kids were younger, I remember other parents telling us to enjoy the moment because before we knew it, it would be over that we would turn around one day to find our kids grown and the house empty and they would be out the door and we would think, how did that happen? It was like it happened overnight. And when other parents would tell us this, in those days when the hours were long and maybe the, even the minutes longer, when life was about getting kids fed and doing bath time and reading book after book after book, sometimes I thought my voice would wear out just trying to read enough books to get the kids to fall asleep. And that was after I'd yelled at them. So of course my voice is like, you know, I'm just kidding, I probably didn't, I didn't yell that much, that, that much, just a little bit. So when other parents told me that it would be over just like that and was in the middle of it, I just didn't believe them. But now with one kid out the door and another one about to graduate and an empty nest looming, I'm starting to get the picture. One day your life, uh, life is bound up in others' schedules and their needs and their activities. And the next day, well, I'll let you know how that next day is when it happens. But one day, right? One day your life is this and the next day it's that. One day the world is fine, the next day stuff happens and the world is at war. And morals and ethics and who is right and who is wrong lacks clarity as it always does so, I suppose, but there are moments when it's right in our face. That the right thing is not clear and the right thing is elusive and we can't seem to grab a hold of it. And while leaders and politicians debate those ethics and morals and what the right thing is to do, trying to find the good action, while leaders and politicians debate that, people, and many of them children are starving and dying. And generations of conflict that we thought were maybe shrinking have turned into more generations of conflict. And it feels like peace that we want and dream of and sing about is so elusive. And it turns out this whole loving your neighbors thing is indeed way more complicated than we want it to be. Why can't we get food to people who need it? Why can't we get food into Gaza? Why can't we? Gaza, Sudan, Haiti are all on the verge of famines being declared in that place. And just when you think life is working and everybody has what they need, and probably that's the same true in, in, with neighbors next door for us, maybe we just don't see it, but why is it that there are people starving in this day and age? One day we think we have it figured out, we human beings, and the next day it's so clear that we do not. One day. One day life is well and good, and the next day you get news. One day you're a part of the okay people, and the next day you're in this category of not doing so well over here. One day you're in with life, and the next day you're 
in the outs. One day. On the day that Jesus enters into Jerusalem, he has been making his way there with his disciples as we have seen and heard and read through our reading through the Gospel of Mark. And on this day that Jesus enters into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday to us, the people are excited to see him. One day you're in and the next day you're out, but on this day that Jesus enters into Jerusalem, he is clearly in with the people and they are excited to see him. Although the crowd, crowd's excitement we know, as people who know the whole story, is not they're not fully getting it, why Jesus is, is there and what he is truly, really all about. They know and what they hope and want him to be, right? They, they know and they hope and they want him to be the one who's going to solve all their problems, the one who's going to be what the prophets said there would be, a new King David who would restore them to glory and a political standing in the world and they would be a great nation again. Jesus is king, of course. But his power is over sin and death, and he knows to fully be this king, he has to keep going. He doesn't stop just at this parade and these hosannas, but he has to keep going to the cross where he faces his own death and ours. And to get there, he knows that it's our sin that will do it. No wonder he needs a donkey on which to ride into Jerusalem. Carrying all that sin has got to be heavy. The crowd, not knowing all of that, but in their hopes and expectations of what they want Jesus to be, the crowd in that moment celebrate the parade and the guy in front of them and they shout and they lay down palm branches and they lay down their cloaks and they, they shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And we, well, we cannot help but join them, right? It's a moment. And why wouldn't we? And I know it's a little bit against our you know, good Midwestern roots, but here we did, we did the same thing, you did it when we were singing, you raised it while we spoke, and you said it too, do it with me, just for get kicks and giggles again, Hosanna, 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 right, we feel ourselves doing it as well. But don't worry, if you're uncomfortable waving things in church, it doesn't last long. Because as the saying goes, one day you're in and the next day you're out. And that turn to the outs for Jesus happens in just a few chapters in the Gospel of Mark, where we find Jesus in another kind of procession and another kind of parade. Listen and follow along from Mark 15 as you see the words on, you, on the screen. Notice the ones that are in the orangish, reddish color. Those are your words that you will say. And with this point in Mark 15, Jesus has been betrayed, he's been arrested, and now the authorities are dealing with him. Mark 15, verse 1, as soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a, held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, you say so. Then the chief priest accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, Pilate used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came again and began to ask Pilate for, for them according, to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For as he realized that it was all of jealousy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again, then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back. <laughs> Pilate asked them, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more. <laughs> so Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Hosanna, you were just saying, and crucify him? I mean, what's wrong with you? <coughs> one minute, here you are shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, and the next minute, crucify him? But isn't that just the way it is? 
And isn't that what we do? We want Jesus one minute and we push him in the way the next. So is the way of our human, fickle hearts. And boy, if our salvation is dependent on our hearts to choose God, then my brothers and sisters in Christ, we are doomed. Because look at what they do. But Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey and Jesus going to the cross reveals that salvation is not on us and our fickle hearts that choose something one day and push it away the next. In fact, Jesus finds us in our fickleness, in our doomedness, in our sin, our hopes, our expectations, and all of our stuff, and gets us to then ask for the very thing that we need. And the very thing that he came to get, uh, give us. Hosanna, we say. And we shout it as a word of praise, but what it actually means is save us, O oh God. Save us. Which is music to a Savior's ears. Taylor Swift has a song called Soon You'll Get Better, which she wrote in response to both of her parents having gone through cancer and uh, having it treated, and especially her mother, who if I get my facts straight, fought breast cancer twice. But having that experience of someone being ill and having a, a d diagnosis that is very serious and this deep, desperate desire for them to get better, to return to health. In one of the lines, she references prayer and faith, singing, desperate people find faith, so now I pray to Jesus too. Jelly Roll, another singer-songwriter, says it this way, only talk to God when I need a favor, and God, I need a favor. On the days when we are on the outs with life, we sort of know we are desperate, don't we? And what easily flows off our tongue is a prayer, save me, O oh God, Lord, be with me, God, have mercy, Lord, please do this one thing for me, I need your help. But Jesus does not wait for only these moments, these moments when we know that we need God. Now Jesus knows that in spite of what we think, even when we think we have it all together and we're on the in and with life and we are good to go, even in those moments, we still need God, that there never is a time that we are always desperate in every moment for salvation. And so Jesus delivers it to us no matter the state of our lives, whether we are happy and excited or whether we are in the dumps and life is falling apart, whether we push God away or whether we are welcoming God in, whatever it is, God doesn't rely on us to do the work of salvation or to make the choice for God. God makes the choice for us and simply comes and gives it and reveals that he is the one who brings salvation to those desperate for saving, which is all of us, that he is the one that brings mercy to sinners, that he is the one who makes all things new for the broken. And so he gets us just to admit it and say, Hosanna and crucify him, which is all one and the same, people admitting, and God working in us that repentance that says, that confession that says, yeah, I need you, because that is the work of God to both show you what you need and then deliver it to you. And then God does the work that God came to do and actually does it. Hosanna, we say, save us, O God, and Jesus does it. That is, saves you by forgiving you all your sins already and as we speak and tomorrow and every day after that by dying and rising for your sake. Hosanna, a promise that is given to you, a promise in Christ who saves God's people from their sins, who has already saved you and is saving you and promises to always do so even through death, which leaves us, my brothers and sisters in Christ, free in confidence to say with one another, do it with me, Hosanna, 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 blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord and saves you. Thanks be to God. Amen.